All right. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today's session is called Ask the Expert, Prioritizing and Problem Solving About Justice and Behavioral Health and Collaborative Teams. This is part one of a two-part series. My name is Mark Stobel. I'm the Deputy Program Director here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I'll be facilitating the session today. And I'm joined by Kevin O'Connell, who's our expert for today's session, and also by my colleague, uh, PJ Houston. Houston, sorry. And I'll have them introduce themselves, uh, starting with Kevin. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kevin O'Connell, and I'm excited to kind of uh, walk you through some ideas today about how to kind of organize your work as stepping up counties. Um, and my background is really working with counties um, across, really across California right now and some other, other states. Um, but really, the hope is to kind of give you a container for how to prioritize your work um, with your partners and go from there. So excited to talk to you all. Hello, everybody. My name is PJ Houston. I'm a policy analyst on Stepping Up team. I work uh, with Mark kind of with everything uh, Stepping Up um, and great to have you all here today. I'll pass it back over to Mark. Great. Yeah, and then just for a little bit of background on the session. Uh, so at the Justice Center, we do these Ask the Expert sessions with our law enforcement mental health learning sites and also with our criminal justice mental health learning sites. And so we wanted to borrow the model or the format for stepping up. And Kevin has expertise working with many counties in California in particular on their stepping up initiatives. And we wanted him to lend his expertise to this session. So Kevin will start with a walkthrough of a framework for problem solving, beginning with the introductory steps for developing uh, a problem statement and showing a roadmap of different steps for how counties can be systematic and how they um, collaborate and be intentional about the direction that they're moving in. Um, so our thinking is that uh, after Kevin gives his overview, county teams can process this information in real time and ask questions. And so feel free to enter questions into the chat as we go along and we can keep track of them. And then after Kevin's overview, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask a question. We want this session to be really conversational and really discussion based. And we also recognize that all of you are experts at the county, city, or state level as you work on how to solve problems at the intersection of justice and behavioral health and how to improve outcomes for people affected by these systems. And so we want to hear from all of you as well. We're recording this session, and so we'll put a, um, a link in the chat to the webpage where you can find the recording once it's available. And also I'll make a plug for the second session of this scheduled for October 28th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Um, and also during the session, we'll drop um, uh, Kevin's uh, flowchart and PowerPoint and also an Excel template for identifying and formulating a problem statement. So I think that's everything. And Kevin, I'll just turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, I think as Mark was saying, like really the, the only expertise I bring in this is I've kind of worked in enough different counties and different jurisdictions to kind of think about, um, you know, how do we get collaboratives to do more than I think what they're maybe think they can do? Because a lot of efforts like stepping up are, they're highly collaborative. Like there is no one answer. There's no one program. There's no one project. Um, it's really a series of different steps you're going to try and take to figure out not just what you want to do with your time as a collaborative, but also the kind of programs and practices you want to put in place um, to actually do that. So um, the idea behind this, I think, talk was really to kind of not just say, like, here's the answer, but actually here's a way to think about this and to organize some of the work you're already doing. Um, a lot of my work is both related to um, some of the federal grants that come out that really do inquire a lot of collaboration. But more generally, like when you get a group together, it's going to work together. How do you kind of go from we have a goal to actually, here's the thing we want to do. Because I think the thing I've observed in a lot of counties is the hardest thing is really setting priorities that work for people, knowing that this year might not be the year, the thing that's the most important to you, but maybe next year is the year we kind of do that. But without a roadmap and some shared reasons why we're working together, it goes back to, well, why are we meeting in the first place? Um, and I think the, the, the durability of stepping up groups really comes down to how can you have a shared kind of mission a little bit? But also make sure it feels like you're kind of addressing the problems in a robust way that everybody's bringing their expertise and you're also learning from each other because you can't be an expert in probation, jails, courts, police, behavioral health, um, hospitals, you know, court, everything else on there. You can only have the expertise you have. But the idea is to kind of make sure we're sharing information in a way that actually people understand each other's limits and they understand their abilities and their expertise is better and not just the thing you think you know because you heard a meeting one time, but actually a deeper understanding of each other's work. And then also, you know, the kind of resources you have in the community. 
Um, and so the, I think the, the doc I'm going to share is really just kind of a, a framework to do that. It's really a way to put your expertise into a framework. Again, it's not the answer, but it's a way to kind of think through this systematically. And I think the version that will be dropped in the chat will be something you can edit. Um, and also a, a kind of a way to kind of make sure you can put those together. Um, so the purpose of the day is really to kind of give you the framework and walk through it and then really kind of, you know, problems or questions you have, um, how to go about doing that kind of in real time. So um, I'm going to share my screen now. And you should see kind of the, the title page there. And we'll go from there. Um, so really the, the kind of the, the roadmap I kind of thought about, and this is after kind of reflecting a little bit on doing this in enough places where I saw some of the stepping up initiatives succeed for a little bit of time. Other ones, they had more time. They really did kind of have durability as a group that came and met. And one of the kind of things I kind of saw was that it really does start with a clear sense of collaboration and then how to develop, you know, kind of shared goals and priorities. Um, and again, this is stuff you probably already do, but this maybe gives you a framework to do it in and how to share that as more of a, you know, a shareable document to edit together. So the steps I kind of we're going we're gonna to go through today are really kind of more general. How do you go from step one? We want to work together. So what are we doing? Um, two, how do we help to understand each other's what different agencies do and really kind of their, again, who they serve, how they serve them, what they can offer a collective as a way to make sure all the collaborators understand each other. Um, three is then actually do a, a develop an actual inventory of your programs to know what these different acronyms do. Um, a really common challenge I see is that people don't understand each other's programs enough to really know them more than a program they know that used to exist, maybe doesn't exist now. The sequential intercept model is a really helpful way to do that, not just to kind of see a whole system, but to see parts of systems you maybe don't think about a lot or don't know enough about, create that visual map as well as that inventory. And then from that, really creating that first problem, like what are we really trying to do here is what are the gaps we're seeing once we create that map? Um, and then four is really then to go deeper and say, well, what's really driving? What's the root cause of why we're seeing this problem that we're kind of identifying initially? And then five, kind of finish up and validate that problem and say, we're seeing this problem. We think we should prioritize it through these different things. So the idea behind this, this initial um, kind of steps is really to go from we want to meet to now we have an area of focus. And then next time on the 20th, we'll actually be digging a little deeper to say, well, how do we prioritize? How do we kind of understand what it's going to do? And then how do we go to a finished product of something being a budget request, a grant proposal, change in work process or system change, whatever it is, how do you start with those questions? So I'm gonna kind of walk through this framework pretty quickly. Um, the, in the chat is the actual is the actual PowerPoint. And I tried to write this as a, um, all the slides in here is actually things you can edit. So I put some examples in there of just things you can use, but the idea is not that these are the answers, it's more to take out what you're doing, use this as a framework or a template, and then you can use that and see how it works. And then maybe in the, the last half of this, we can actually talk through where this makes sense, where it doesn't, what are the actual steps to do these things? Because again, these don't create themselves. It takes work and collaboration. And maybe that's where we can talk a little more about. So I'm gonna walk through this framework um, pretty quickly just to give time for Q and A, um, but really starting with um, kind of what each one of the steps are um, and why we do them. So, you know, collaborative direction, canvas map, which really tells you what each agency does, the sequential intercept model to identify gaps, and then really kind of root cause thinking about what's really driving these really complex interagency issues, and then how to actually create that problem statement and the goal statement. What are we trying to do and how are we going to do it? Um, and again, these all can just be gut checks about what your intuition is, but how do we go about doing it? Um, so collaborative direction, um, these go by lots of names. Um, again, this is not new to anybody who's probably done programming work, but what are we, what's our mission here? What are we really trying to do as a group and why are we coming together? Um, some of that language is in the stepping up, you know, kind of guidelines and roles if you're a part of that. But these can be lots of things. But really, it's like, what are we really trying to do as a group in a, in a mission of this as different from everything else any agency does? Because all your agencies have roles and responsibilities and guidelines and guardrails and budgets. All that's one part. But you're really saying, what is a collaborative you're trying to do? So what's the mission of it? And that can be a, a singular focus if it's going to be time limited or broader. But the idea is to make sure you can articulate that as a, the big goal of things. And then in terms of the collaborative, what do you want to try and accomplish in the near term? Um, you know, so a simple statement like the goal of the collaborative, not just the mission, but in the next year, we want to, next year or two years, we want to do X. We want to accomplish something, make it really clear. And then how do we do that? We have different goals. We want to increase deflection and diversion by some percent. We want to reduce returns to custody for a very specific population. We want to reduce lengths of stay for people under certain circumstances. So we want to kind of make sure we have like a, a why, a what, and a how. And again, this can be kind of that guiding document. So when you do see, see like shiny pennies and new things or new initiatives or new requirements, you, can you point it back to this goal and make sure that those either align or they don't? And not everything is going to fit, and that's okay. 
So I think the value of this, it gives you some guardrails as a group because every, almost every single kind of collaborative group I see, people have a second job. They have other things they've got to do. They've got other responsibilities. And if this group isn't really tightly aligned, it becomes another thing on the list and not something that really people are being thoughtful about. So the importance of this is really to make sure you have something to guide, to look back to. And if you are someone who's reporting up to an agency head or somebody else, you can tell them, hey, this is what we're working on, and this is the team we're doing it with, and this is why we're doing it, so they know why it fits and why it's different than anything else going on. Um, again, just getting good collaborative direction. Um, these are all editable to kind of fit your local needs, but you know, again, really important to have the why. Um, the next document is then, for each agency, a really simple way to convey what they do. So let's say you have a couple agencies. Let's, this is an example from a behavioral health forensic team. Um, how do you convey what the work you do is without really knowing the limits of it and what you do and where you serve people? So this is kind of a template that I've used a couple of times just to make sure people understand each other's role, both in kind of what they do, their activities, um, what kind of resources they have, um, what they provide that's different than anything else, and then also what their capabilities are, and then who do they partner with more broadly. Because sometimes you only know other agencies from who you, in the little way you work with them, not the full set of things they might be doing. Um, and the other ones I think that are probably the most useful is really understanding each other's cost structure and their revenue. Because um, if you're like a lot of health departments, the revenue is complicated. It's complex. Some of it's really is fee for service, really specific things, other things they can and can't do because of law. But the better you can understand the cost structure and how they kind of generate, generate funds to do their work, the better you can then work together and not feel like someone isn't jumping into something because you may not understand what drives their the revenue or what actually is their budget because some some agencies are general fund or like are really kind of from some kind of a um, an appropriation or entitlement other ones are really complicated so the better you can understand each other the better you can work together um so that's kind of at the, the agency level and then at the system level um again this is meant to be a little small so don't don't try and read too close um really to kind of do that really like kind of eight, like kind of program mapping to go from we know we have some services in the jail to do something to, well, what are those services? What do they do? What's the evidence for them? Why do we do them? What's coming our way? And so when I've done these, I, you know, sequential understanding model is not new. I did not invent it. Um, most of you probably have done them in some way or kind of looked at it, but it's a way to kind of show at each one of these points in the system, what are the resources and what are those connections? Not because we know they don't exist, but because we know that they are there, but how can we make sure we know what those different things are? So the functions I see this filling is it's an inventory of programs because people don't always know what they don't know about other people's programs. Um, it's a kind of form of gap analysis. If we kind of see a function that, that has no piece to it, we can ask why. And then also it's a way to start like, prioritizing different ideas or different gaps that come up in conversation. Um, and again, I think these can, a program or kind of a priority can be any one of these areas. How do you kind of at least making it sure we understand what the resources are now? Because you know, sometimes you just don't know about other people's resources until you kind of see it in an inventory. And the idea is to make, again, develop some collaborative tools to then go to start solving problems. Um, so if there's a theme for these first three slides, it's really to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I think alignment is one of the most important things for collaborative efforts, because if you're going to something, you don't know why you're going, you don't know enough about each other, you're not going to be able to collaborate. Um, and so I think these three kind of basic steps of the high level vision, um, the next step being kind of making sure that you can identify what each agency does and how they what they bring to the table. And then the ability to actually have, you know, some kind of a system mapping can be kind of those three easy steps or three, not easy, uh, three first steps. Um, these would take extra effort to really put them together. But these are all things that there's a lot of resources out there for. And these templates give you a container to say what we're all doing together. And then really by that first, you know, once you've done the sequential intercept model and some of that mapping, you're probably at least ready to say what your problem, what your kind of first kind of problem statement is. What are you trying to really solve and start kind of thinking about your goal? And the reason this first one's important is you kind of go from all the things you could be doing, all those different steps and all those different ideas you have, all the grants, all the all the have tos to what is this group going to do? And so, you know, these can be collaboratively done and they're best done through kind of a, a working session that really does have a, a way to think about how do we go from our mission to a problem we want to prioritize. And this can be kind of general. But the idea is to kind of bring back, you know, really the, the problem statement, which is, you know, this is not a you know super unique problem statement, but it's, you know, probably one that resonates with most folks. Um, people with mental health needs are cycling through jails and emergency departments due to a lack of options in the community. They're the place you go because there are no other options. Maybe that's a problem you might face. I work a lot in rural communities where it's not so much the intent isn't there, but there's just no place to take somebody. So how do we do that? And it's not just about having more physical infrastructure. It's about what are the processes that actually Tell us someone's there to be that has a need. How do you get them there? And then how do you make sure the next step they take is 
towards stability and towards community resources. And so maybe the goal initially is to create a, a viable option that is flexible from jail or the emergency department, as well as provide an option for stable reentry. So that's kind of where you're starting with. We know people are cycling. How do we deflect them? But also, how do we make sure that we can actually get them someplace else to keep make sure they're stable in the community? And maybe the reason you come up with are there's no 24-7 options to do any of this. Um, we lack housing, lack of treatment options, lack of coordination. Maybe those are the themes you're kind of finding in your community. So from this, um, the idea is that you would then take this and go, well, let's really unpack these four ideas because it's kind of easy to say the problem statement without really going into why. And the reasons can then help you develop what is called like a, a cause and effect. So you're, really it's what's your theory of happening. And so this visual tool helps to kind of do that. And so the layout of this and the version in the packet has a, a you know, kind of a one you can fill in yourself. But um, this is one where we kind of like have that same problem statement. And what we tried to do is say, our, this is the problem we're trying to get to, this one in purple, um, homeless clients with physical and mental health needs cycle through the ED in the jail. That's the thing that people feel like that's the problem we're really trying to solve here. And then we took those things and said, well, what are the what are the big themes across this these top ones? So the ones in teal are kind of like more of the human service or kind of major categories of things we see on the human service side. And then start brainstorming what those options are or what those ideas are of why this is happening. And so some of it comes from those 24-7 options, affordable housing in the community, coordination, you know, client isolation, maybe lack of engagement in services, um, access to care, intake, and then kind of put down what we kind of thought was really driving from those themes back to that thing in purple. So what this allows you to do is kind of, because like, things can be quite complicated, to kind of really document why it's complicated. So you kind of have a handle on what makes it complex and not feel like you're just, you know, kind of sitting in the complexity, but also just document it. Say what makes it complex and have that shared vision of what you what is kind of happening and why. Um, and so in the packet, you'll see a, a version of this you can then edit, but it really helps to kind of articulate what makes something feel like an impossible situation, make it more graspable. Um, and from that, um, we can revise it, the problem statement and start to hear the goal statement. So the idea is like from that initial work, we said, we're going to kind of still have that same problem statement, but now we're going to make it a little more, more specific. Um, you know, and I think, again, it can be slightly, slightly edited, but it has a little more robust information in it. We kind of want to get to like why this is happening. So then we can design a program that actually would fit that. So the problem statement then is a little more articulate, a little more clear, kind of based in kind of that investigation and that thinking about really why is this thing happening? You kind of then re revise the goal statement then to be much more specific. It has time, it has a, you know, a goal, you know, and then it also has what you're going to do about it. So the goal statement being people with mental health needs are cycling through the jail and emergency department due to lack of options. And these are complicated by isolation and care and coordination issues. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. The goal statement then is within 12 months, um, we want to have 75% of people hospitalized, um, oops, typo, uh, during their jail stay, um, be transported to a client success center to receive screenings, assessment, and coordination and release. So maybe that's like the option that the thing they want to try and develop. We don't know how we're going to do it. We don't really have all the pieces to it. We don't know what, what all that might entail, but that's kind of our goal here. And then our reasoning is, you know, same reasons. Then you kind of like, then again, put in what the different parts are, kind of why you think that's happening. So you've kind of gone from a big idea to some specifics, and then you start going to prioritization and thinking about how and where you're going to do that work. Um, and so the, the template here really kind of, uh, kind of allows you to kind of go from, we've got a lot of things we could do, to something more specific. And I think with this, as I kind of think about how to use this, it might be in a collaborative group. Um, it might be in something where you're actually going to be talking to people about, you know, kind of pitching your idea, but without kind of a clear way to document it and just pass it out and share it and, you know, again, edit it, you're really not going to get to that shared place. Um, and I think when I've kind of found the hardest part of this is really the first two or three steps. People have lots of ideas. It's really about where do we start? And I think that really is the hardest part. Where do we prioritize our efforts? And where do we start kind of going with it? Um, and so I think the, the parts of this that I was thinking could be a, a useful for this group really to kind of, you know, as you're kind of walking through this and we do the Q&A is really going to be, you know, how do you kind of really kind of go from we've got all these good ideas to how do we actually say the problem we're going to try and solve? Because you can have multiple problems you're trying to solve at once, but really you have to make sure they're still kind of nested in a why. Why are we doing this? Why now? And then how you do that, you know, could be the work. And so the output of this in what, what I've done before is then we kind of take these and we say, well, now we have a two-year plan. We've got a two-year kind of cycle here to one, this is, our, you know, let's say our revised problem and goal statement is our, our strategy number one, but maybe we have another one as well. So you don't just have to do one of these, but at least kind of going through this process, make sure that each one of these problems you're prioritizing is unique itself. And you're not just doing a lot of very similar sounding things. 
because other things could be also um, put in there as well. And you're also not going to see here is specific programs, specific tools, specific things. It's really that's kind of the next step is how you go about implementing this is that step. But at least you have that grounding in what you're trying to do. Um, and so this kind of gives you is then that framework to have that multi-year plan and also have some shared priorities. Because I think, that, again, that is the biggest challenge I see with a lot of like stepping up kind of teams or kind of county efforts is they all could do so many things. And really, it's that lack of like short term, very clear multi-year effort they want to put in together. And so what this helps to do is align everybody in the group around the same goals and not have everybody kind of go in different directions based on what they think in their agency is the most important. We say, these are our goals and these are the problems we're trying to solve. Now let's put all our effort into doing. Um, so how does that tie into actual program development? That's a great question. Um, that's where we kind of then focus a little bit more next time on how to do that. Um, I want to keep this at the formation stage because this is kind of a, a to me that the biggest challenge is not implementing or having a vision. It's really the part at the beginning of it to make sure we're all collaborating. But um, step six from this, now that we've kind of gone through this initial process, is say, well, how do we like start to prioritize the solutions to that? Um, our goal was something very ambitious. So what are the solutions to do that? What are the changes in systems or processes? What are the new programs we might need to stand up? What are the grants we might need to pursue? How you do that is kind of the next step, as long as you have a good, clear base on why you're doing it and how you're going to do it, and basically kind of the, the why of it all. Um, and then step seven is really kind of how do you create the strategy for that? What are the, what are the changes you're going to see and want to see, and how do we kind of manage some of those? Um, step eight, then actually having a way to project what those impacts are going to be. Um, and a lot of my work, when we're talking about things like diversion, sometimes you're pushing you know, people from one area to a different system. How do you make sure you understand what that's going to be? If you're going to reduce the length of stay in the jail to divert somebody, that's going to then create a year or two program for somebody in the community. Do we have those resources that can match up with the diversion and the effort in the, in the jail to then create that long-term treatment stability? So it's a way to estimate some of those and all the tool I'll share that you can use to create some easy projections of that to kind of look at caseloads and costs from what you're trying to do. And step nine, you then develop your budget request or kind of a, a standard of work. So if you're, you're really focused on a new program, how do you create that budget request that's either internal to an agency or maybe looking at grants? I have a little template you can use to actually kind of develop a really clear budget, pro budget change process within this that's coming from the collaborative, um, but also some templates for creating what's called a standard of work. If we feel like they're, the reason that sometimes these things are happening is because there's maybe inconsistent you know, system, system inefficiencies or things that aren't connecting, how do we create a standard of work that will ensure more of that stability for these people and also build your program? So the idea is to kind of go from, we want to work together to actual programs. And then honestly, the part that keeps repeating itself is going to be the probably six to nine. You can kind of use those same collaborative work over and over again, because that's now your basis to keep doing more things. But the important part really is to prioritize what are some of the big things you want to tackle and then how do you do it comes next. So I'm going to stop there. I know that um, probably some questions about this and some details, but I want to kind of stop there just with either kind of experience with this, because I think your all's experience doing just this work is probably just as important as the little template. Um, but want to stop there and kind of open up to questions or Q&A, things like that. All right, looks like we have a hand raised on Zoom. Brandy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thanks so much. That was like really helpful context. Um, and I appreciate, I'm a visual person, so I appreciate like the mapping out of it. Um, one of the things you mentioned um, is something that we have tried to address here. I'm from Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Um, is uh, you mentioned the systems have a different language. They talk differently. You know, they don't understand each other. <clears throat> and one of the things we've done to try to combat that is um, we created a behavioral health justice collaborations um, work group that is, it, it's, a, it's a large group, um, but it includes representatives from um, behavioral health providers that often serve people who are justice involved. Uh, many of our justice partners, including like our specialty courts, our public defenders, um, our justice related services, um, and other um, justice partners, the jail. Um, and we all come together uh, once every other month. And um, we have like a provider spotlight 
for a, a mental health and a substance use provider, which are like kind of really short presentations to help the justice system understand what programs are out there and kind of criteria at each meeting. But then we have a presentation and sometimes it's a justice presentation and sometimes it's a behavioral health presentation, but it's kind of like system level to help us gain a shared understanding of like what is actually happening. Like we hear these words, but we don't know what that means. And, and so I think we've built a lot of um, collaboration through that group. And we regularly have people say, hey, I heard about this group. How do I join? Um, because uh, folks are getting a lot out of it. Um, we, we have a very consistent attendance of between 80 and 120 people. Um, we're meeting virtually. And, and I think that's just... Um, we're doing a lot of collaborative projects, but that has really helped us um, kind of build those and foster those relationships, even though like the, a lot of the people in those groups are frontline. They're not like the leadership people. It, it's still like it, the effect of it kind of escalates. And then the leadership folks are more more engaging with the projects as we reach out because there's like this shared, this kind of commonality, like mm -hmm. we understand each other better. And so um, I just wanted to mention that uh, that was a big issue here. Um, we One example is successful discharge from a program, a treatment program is very different to a probation officer or a judge versus a treatment provider. So we spent like a whole session talking about the differences and how we actually had a, a sub work group that did communication protocol between probation officers and providers to help providers understand how to communicate with the probation officers in a mm -hmm. way that would be less harmful to their individuals who maybe aren't um, completing a full program, but they did what the court wanted them to do. So um, that's just an example. Yeah. Well, what I, what I like about that, I think that's where like the challenge of these groups, because you could change that, that initial charter. So this is actually about education and better understanding each other. And that's the purpose. We're not trying to I think sometimes like if the and I would say COVID taught me a lot about like heavy, complex, like mission. We got to do all these things right now. People peace out. Like they can't, like they can't get there. They're too busy. Too fr like Zoom is not great for a lot of things. And it's really not great for hammering out collaborative plans either. But having to say our mission is really just make sure this is like a, you know, we bring a program, someone talks about it. And, you know, it's kind of more organic and really kind of a people kind of, it's a, you know, not lunch and learn, but it's a learning, it's a learning collaborative about your own system. And then really that's really the goal of this group, make sure we all understand programs and practices and how to access them and make sure we're dispelling myths. And, you know, there's somebody who's really making sure we're understanding each other better. I think that can be just as valuable as a collaborative as we want to, we have these very stern goals that we're going to reach because, you know, that that's a different meeting. So I think that can be a really good starting off point. But like, what do we want to know about our, our team? And then have that book that says like, here's our briefing book of, all the acronyms that you know probation uses or here's all the acronyms that they use and mm -hmm. now you have that as a resource so next time you know more than you did a week ago mm -hmm. but i think that's a great idea for like a collaborative group yeah thank you Brandy. Um, I'll put a pitch in um, while other folks have questions. Like, really, I think that's, you know, how do we create some of these, almost like a little a book, I would call it, like just like the count, like a county book of some kinds that, even though it seems a little obvious, but it's really a place where you can, everyone kind of has the same information um, and be it things around like, a you know, the system mapping, I think can be helpful. And this is kind of where like having a sequential intercept model be like a resource. So people can just go kind of access it. And the versions I've done, they actually have like a pretty robust inventory behind it of like, what is that program? What is an arraignment? What is this discharge program? Who runs it? What's the budget? So it really helps people to think collaboratively if they know a little more detail about what people do. And I think Brandy's point too, it's like, how do you kind of make sure there's a, a good sense of what we're all doing together and people are all as informed as possible. Um, but again, it comes back to that, that mission. If your mission is to understand each other better and just use your resources, but no new programs, that's really good. You make sure you're really clear about that versus like we want to hit these very, you know, challenging goals sometimes. So collaborates can have a couple different missions.
um, with, as folks are kind of looking at things like um, if folks had a chance to open up the, the docs, um, maybe we can, all, we can also kind of review that as well or kind of talk about how you might edit some of these. I think there's, again, the idea is that these are meant to be tools you can kind of take and use and this gives you a framework for doing. Um, but I think those are kind of part of the part we're trying to make sure those are in your hands as well and that you're working. And I can jump in with a back pocket question, both for Kevin and for all the county and local teams that are on the session. So what are some of the key ingredients for a successful collaboration? I know it sounds basic perhaps, but you know, if like when collaboration works well, like what are some of the key things that you can put your finger on and say, yes, because of this, that collaborative really worked well to help us solve that problem, help to help us get that program up and running. What are some of the, the key ingredients for success? I'll just say an observation, and I, I would I think people, other people might might disagree with this. Is I think it's making sure leadership, as in high level county leadership, knows why this program exists or what this collaborative is trying to do and where it fits in like a you know decision making structure. Um, because I think that sometimes some groups, if they're driven by grants, they sometimes get lost. But if they're really kind of an existing framework to get people collaborating, those I think really have to make sure they're embedded in like a a, a clear county structure. Um, so I think sometimes it's really important to make sure that there's like, you know, leadership really knows why this is happening and how this can help um, versus things that kind of become like a, a project that's, you know, in the middle of the organization somewhere, which doesn't always connect at a higher level. Um, and I think maybe back to like the, the type of work, like an educational form and collaboration can happen anywhere, um, but it's really meant to drive programs or budget choices or, you know, resource allocation. It has to be pretty high level because then you're getting, you know, into a much more, you know, a much more collaborative place of a different area, which is budgets. And, you know, those are all always like, you know, one of the biggest things that make, make programs like this work or not work is who's going to pay for different parts of a new program or a new new population or innovation. Thanks, Kevin. And from the counties, any brave volunteers to share from your perspective about what are some of the key ingredients and key components of what makes a successful collaboration. I guess I'll I'll jump in real quick. So for us, um, these templates would have been amazing when we first started because. We started with absolutely nothing and we were totally lost in the very beginning and not knowing, you know, how to bring people together. We we had the the want and the drive to do it, but we just kind of fumbled in the very beginning. But one of the main things that worked for us, um, going back to what Kevin said, we had buy in from the top. You know, we had leaders who wanted this collaborative component and wanted it to work together. But the thing that worked best for us was identifying people within each organization and at each level who were passionate about this and who would be committed to this. And then we brought those folks to the table as well. So if a leader couldn't make it to maybe one of the meetings, then we wanted to make sure that that particular individual was there. And from there, things just kind of blossomed because then we would learn, hey, I know so-and-so in this organization, they would be perfect to fill this need in our map. And, and so they would come aboard that way. So it's it was really just having committed people from each um, agency and each organization who kind of told their friends. It was like that Wrigley gum mm -hmm. commercial. You know, you tell a friend and you tell a friend. That worked very well for us. And and like, I, you know, Mark knows we were very, very simple in the in the beginning. And, you know, we didn't have all this fancy stuff, but we sure could have used it then. So, um, so thank you for this. Yeah. Well, I think it cannot I mean, it, and Carl, like, you know, if this is useful as to kind of like as a container, but I, I think what you said about bringing the best people really does help, but those best people are highly in, are in high demand usually. That's what makes them the best people. Um, and I think that's really the challenge too, is like, how do you get the right people to come at this and really, you know, they all know why they're there. Um, one question I had for you though, is like, had there been moments where you felt like the, the culture was off or like the, the right people were there, but it was just like the mix wasn't there. How did you kind of deal with just like the, you know, people working with people? Um, 
I guess sometimes uh, one of the frustration for us may have been, you know, people had different priorities and we wanted them to kind of focus and hone in on one particular thing that we were trying to work in. Some of our meetings just kind of kind of ran amok, you could say, and, you know, we would try to address, address one thing and then another organization says, you know, yeah, that's good, but, you know, we have this going on. So just kind of kind of honing that focus um, and keeping everybody on the same priority um, was difficult at times. And, uh, you know, it's, it is kind of difficult when you have, you know, a lower ranking person trying to talk to another ranking person from another agency that's much higher than you. So um, one thing that helped with us is that we kind of set the stage that whenever we were working on um, a particular project, everybody was going to be equal. Um, so you may have had a sheriff or a chief of police, you know, and you might have had a deputy saying that everybody agreed that we all brought expertise to the table. So that mutual level of respect um, could be there and people would not be intimidated by rank and titles and things like that. And that was very mm -hmm. helpful once we got started. I think that's an amazing observation because I think especially in more hierarchical, you know, because law enforcement tends to be a little more hierarchical where, you know, other ones are a little more organic. I think just having that understanding that we're all here to act, like we all have expertise and it's really not about agency head talking to agency head. It's really about the mix of experiences. Cause I've seen some agencies like their, their, their agency heads are at every single meeting. They're everywhere. I don't know how they make the time, uh, but really they're, they're everywhere. And so if you have this sense of hierarchy, then you kind of lose people's ability to kind of be just speak their mind. Um, but also it sounds like you had really good agendas too. Right? Very clear people are clear about why they were there week to week, month to month. And that's even maybe even more important is like a good, a good solid agenda will help a lot of the direction as well. One thing that was helpful in putting the team together, we didn't want it to just be all agency heads. Although they have decision-making authority, we asked those individuals to tell us who is, who's your star player, you know, who's your champion when it comes to this cause and please appoint that person to our group and give them the autonomy, you know, to make some decisions and, and to give input on behalf of that agency head. And that was helpful. Yeah, cause I think those are all the things that go into like what makes a group work culturally, not just like, hey, cause I think because it's all about tough decisions all the time, then you lose that ability to kind of talk through it because sometimes if you're always driving to that outcome, it may take a while to get there. It may take a while to get the consensus. And it's always about, you know, agency heads will kind of bring that that sense of like imperative. But then if you're not able to just talk about it in a more informal way and just work through things, it maybe just feels different. So I think that those kind of ground rules to keep everybody kind of on the same page, I think is really is great. Thank you. And Kevin, we got a question in the chat too. I, I could read it out loud if that's helpful. Um, yeah. Can you talk about some of the different sources of information that you use in a root cause analysis? Do you have any go-to resources? Yeah, um, I think the I, I think initially when Mark and I were talking about this, this presentation, you know, because my background is kind of bringing a lot of different data sources to kind of figure out what we know and don't know about each other. And this, I think we kind of agreed that data can be kind of a snooze a little bit. Sometimes we're kind of saying, bring a lot of data. It's like, well, bring what data? Um, and so I think with the root cause analysis, really the probably the backup to this would say, what do we know about this problem and why is it happening? Even just doing a case file review. So I think one of the resources I usually use is like, if we can identify a simple question and look at a couple, even like five or 10 case files, just say, why is this happening? Um, so let's say an example would have been like, people aren't showing up for the probation office visits. Why is that happening? Look at a couple of case files and just take a look. Is it about transportation? Is it about, you know, access is about, you know, misunderstandings about something, how to kind of just do a little bit of a review first. And then you start going to the brainstorming part of like, well, why is it really happening? And so what I think the root cause analysis kind of thinking allows you to do is go from, geez, this is so complicated why someone's not doing it to just making sure and grouping it a little bit. Um, and so the resources I usually think of are, you know, one going to be case file reviews, doing some interviews, um, just of like people that are doing the work themselves, if you're not one doing the work. Um, and really kind of more of a problem, I would just say like making sure you understand, is it something that you have a handle on or is it really gonna be more complex than just doing one or two things? Um, and so one of the things I'll, I'll bring in a couple of weeks is actually like a little kind of like, it's almost like a little flow chart for how to think about this problem is something I can just go fix right now versus these are things I need to kind of really collaborate on and how to do that. Um, and so I think the root cause analysis is just helpful in kind of grouping 
but a lot of that will come from either interviews, case file reviews, or if you have access to multi-system data to really think about like, is it really true that everybody who, you know, is it really true that the homelessness issue around people in jail is really X percent, or is it something different than that, or is there something else driving it? So how do you, can you start probably with a little bit of data analysis and interviews that then drive that, that root cause? Um, I usually do the root cause analysis as a collaborative effort to have people think about, if we know what the big themes are, let's go one step beyond that. Um, and the effort isn't to be so like in the weeds of it, you kind of never get out, but to say, we know it's happening because of this generally, but what is it about that that's not happening? And really to ask why questions. Um, so I have a couple other things. I, it's also, there's other exercises you can do that are a little more like exploratory. Um, the five whys is a good easy one where you take an issue and then basically keep asking why at each one of those down to like down to three or four levels and you get very specific. So there are a couple of tools you can use like that that actually really help to get your brain thinking about it more than just the headline itself. Um, I want to, I'll just maybe share that other, the problem statement, because I think um, like a lot of tools that there's this process, but I think the problem statement generally is the part that that spreadsheet that it kind of just walks you through how to create a problem statement. Um, I would say that's probably the, the tool in my toolkit that I use the most is like how to articulate a problem effectively, because if it's too general, it's hard to do. If it's not general enough, it feels too basic. Um, and so I think the idea is to kind of use that. It's really a way to kind of go through that process. And I'll do a quick overview of that if there's no other questions right now, because I think that might help with like how to how to take your own thinking and kind of plug it into that that kind of template. Um, I'll do that real quick and then we'll go back to maybe some more questions. Um, and so some of this is kind of obvious, but you know, really it's kind of a, a step a step through process that kind of show your work. Um, but really like, what's the problem? Like, you know, it's like back to like five or six words. It doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, the who? The where is it happening? When is it happening? Um, are the key performance indicators we care about that it's actually that we're seeing this effect? And so usually it comes back to um, bookings into jail, service connections made, recidivism, some basic themes like that, and say, where are we actually seeing this problem? And then that can then help with driving that root cause analysis as well to think, what are the kind of things we're seeing? And then lastly, can the problem be measured? Because the reason that's important is if it's really something that we don't, we can't actually see happening anywhere, um, that's really challenging. And I, and I wouldn't say the problem is like the lack of data. Usually it's more of like things that are in someone's head or something that they feel like they're really hard to quantify. And so if your problem is that people don't care about X, it's like, well, how do you know that? Is it, is it something that you kind of think or is it actually something you can actually go and measure through some tool? And the reason that's important is that then it's hard to solve a problem if you really can't kind of see it, measure it, and at least assess it. Um, and I think when I say measure, it doesn't have to be with quantitative information. It can be surveys, other things. But if you're trying to measure something that doesn't actually exist anywhere, that becomes becomes a challenge of actually knowing if you're solving it. Um, and so the idea is with, with this kind of a template, you kind of go through with this initial step of kind of what is the problem you're trying to solve through some different steps. Then you write your problem statement from that because that your problem statement ideally has all these components in it to then write it in a very clear, robust way. And then a little bit of a gut check and these are just thinking, I don't do this when I'm doing this more for just kind of a you know purpose of going through these, um, see if it's useful for you all. But, you know, is it specific? Does it actually align to any, any, any key performance indicators of your group? And then also, does it identify a current issue or a current goal? And so hopefully this problem statement then links back up to the reason you're not meeting in the first place. So the reason this is important is that if your initial reason for collaborating was to do something in particular, and this problem statement actually doesn't affect that, then you're really not aligning the efforts at all. So back to like your agency head, if your agency head reads your, your collaboration reason, then your problem statement has nothing to do with that. They would say, well, why is it happening? It, that's not really why we're doing this though. So this is also a tool to make sure that your problem statements align, aligning with kind of what your goals are. Um, and that's kind of the front page of it. And this key point sheet just is like a way to summarize it. So that's just really the instruction manual for how to do it. Um, this is not a science. This is definitely kind of in the world of like how to think about things um, in a structured way and then to kind of show your work. So I think the benefit of this would be showing your work and then kind of making sure that you've kind of seen all the things you need to do. I think that's in the chat as well. Thank you, Kevin. It, it looks like we do have another question in the chat. I can just read it really quickly. 
Um, so John wanted to know, how do you go about getting stakeholders invested in an issue that maybe they don't see themselves as being the cause of? Um, and John, you have an example in here. I don't want to misrepresent it. So if you did want to explain that a little bit as well, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Wisconsin, we have a complex issue right now where individuals are facing low-level misdemeanor crimes like disorderly conducts, are getting caught up in the criminal competency proceedings, and then having to be housed in our jails, awaiting competency restoration proceedings, as well as potential competency restoration in inpatient facilities. They spend, on average, more than 100 days at jail before they get to inpatient facilities and outside stakeholders aren't necessarily buying in they see it as well the state should just have more facilities which is obviously a fiscal restraint so my question is more centered around how do you get stakeholders to buy into the to these types of groups mm -hmm. um, i think it's, i think it's a state and county one, I find those to be the most challenging because I think the, you know, again, every state's different. And I, you know, I think not knowing Wisconsin, um, it really would depend on like one, is the state similarly motivated as the county is? And if the county is, like, how can they explain why it's happening to people? So I think with the competency issue, especially, is it really like in the interest of the community that this person stays a hundred days for a misdemeanor where else they would have probably been out in a few days? And I'm 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 guessing. But part of that is an equity issue that this person probably wouldn't have been in for that similar type of crime for this many days without the issue of their mental health. And so it's not just about where you go next in the capacity. It's also saying, like, is this really fair to this person? And do we agree that that there's a better this, this isn't the best approach? So I think the not my issue is usually more how do we explain it from two different sides? Um, one is going to be one. Is this fair to this person? Is this really what we're trying to build for the state? And is this our values? And the other one would probably be. One, if there's a fiscal issue, how do we think about how to unpack that a little bit? Is it more about people are getting stuck in the system and stuck in this place because there's no capacity? Or is it because really there's a kind of misunderstood need for this, this and actually could be solved a different way, either through um, legal processes to say, could this case be diverted to something and avoid the competency process overall? Or is there a way to say, this is even a front end issue of saying we have better crisis response. These folks maybe wouldn't even be caught up in that system already. So it's a way to kind of go at it from the front end of why it's happening, but then once you're in it, make sure we kind of see the process itself as being, this is taking way too long. But I think the issue of like, the not we don't have bed, we need more bed space, um, I think is really one of the more troubling, challenging ones because new, building new beds is a challenge and it's a fiscal issue, but how do we make sure people understand it's also a fairness issue because people are getting stuck in jail for a hundred days. So the county is now bearing the cost of that incarceration where otherwise maybe that would have been shipped to the state. So I think shifting between state and local is a big issue. And actually in the little projection tool I'll share next time about the competency issue, it can kind of show that to say, if we can shift from the jail to this, maybe the state actually saves money in some instances. So it's a way to think about this in a little more multi-way, but fiscal I think is the part where um, this all kind of usually comes down, especially on bed capacity. Um, so I think buy-in is really more about, do we actually can we actually explain the problem that will actually get people animated? And in a county, I can see that happening easier than I can between state and county. Sorry, but that's a starting place. And Laurie, I see your other um, question there. Um, some problem where there's a lawsuit filed by disability rights organizations against our THCS or um, general health, health services. I think that's the same thing. It's like looking at it from, and this is where the root cause analysis actually can be helpful. Is it, why are these competency hearings happening? Because once you're in them, it sets off a series of events and legal protocols and health protocols that really, how did we get there? So I think usually, I guess the way that I thought about it is how do we both like reduce the number of people being found incompetent, but also then in that situation, deal with it in the most expedient way and really understand why someone's there each moment and who really controls each part of it. Because if we can reduce the number of people found incompetent, we change that conversation. Um, but also that's not as simple as that. So making sure we can... Um, making sure we can find what motivates people to actually um, understand it is also part of that, that collaborative effort. Yeah, and a uh, okay, good example, Lori. Yeah, so also the external motivation of like lawsuits and kind of those things also then create that fire to say, we've got to look at this right now as a system, not just kind of push it down the river.
Um, but one thing I'll just because we did bring up the competency piece, and that that's kind of next time um, we'll kind of use that as an example for this. Um, and in my work with kind of the, the competency, kind of incompetency, both on the misdemeanor and felony side, um, two things end up happening. One, you end up going to a state institution for a long time to be restored to competency, or you're kind of awaiting that in the local facility. How do we kind of think about that from the point of view of how they how people are getting into you know, the system in the first place, why they're being held, and then what are the different choices a county can make that a county controls versus what the state controls? And some of those will just be li lining out who can do what and when. And then, but why it's important, I think that usually has to come from probably something like a lawsuit or something very intense that now people have to deal with as a system. Because, you know, these, these the state and local entities are not so disconnected. So how do we make sure people see it as one system when we're not always set up that way to do that? And I'll allow the counties uh, to speak again, if anyone wants to unmute themselves. Uh, if anyone would like to share what kind of issues or problems uh, that are going on within your counties that maybe you'd like to try Kevin's uh, framework with? Yeah, and I can chime into that and say, I know that several counties on the line that I recognized are really focused on the early intercept uh, interventions and crisis response. And so um, are, are any of the counties looking forward to, to applying what Kevin has, has shared with us today towards um, your crisis response initiatives. Uh, thanks, Mark. I can chime in. I think you were maybe referring to Waukesha. <laughs> um, so yes, we are uh, making good headway to get more involved with the PSAP and kind of determining when a crisis response would be helpful versus just a law enforcement only response. I think to, to John's point and just kind of overall what we see as a problem though is the statutory, statutory criteria for mental health treatment um, in the state, if we're gonna say is about this high, and then the threshold for a disorderly conduct, a resisting, obstructing, loitering charge is about down here. So sometimes we don't have, we don't feel like we have another tool in the toolbox to really divert from the criminal justice system. And that's where we see people on these low level offenses in in jails and kind of awaiting the, the competency responses as John and John's our uh, chapter 51 attorney here in Waukesha County. Um, so really kind of um, just speaking to that problem is how how big it's getting um, and um, at least that's what that's what's going on here. So we're trying to identify those situations sooner and, uh, of course, always offer voluntary services um, at the time of that contact. Um, but it is the, the person's choice to self-determine if they want to elect to mental health treatment. And, and then we're just kind of left with, um, with uh, just trying to meet the standards of the law, which we know in Wisconsin as well is is getting uh, really more challenging to um, to be in that space of involuntary treatment for the the person's well being um, while meeting standards of of um, the the dangerousness or the the legal standards to keep a person in treatment. One thing I think, and I think this you know competency being a I would say a national issue that's playing out in all counties um, is also that you know that. Incompetency is a social framework. You know, the, your incompetency to stand trial is really a legal piece of a social thing because you can be really mentally quite unwell in the community, but at some point, if you touch the day that you're at your worst day, you also have a disorderly conduct, then suddenly that creates a year to year and a half of your life when you're in a very, you're in that situation. And so I think it also comes down to, you know, how do attorneys deal with this with people that are seemingly unstable and maybe not able to participate? Because even in across the, the threshold is still, can you participate in your own defense? And the trade off there is somebody who doesn't understand what's happening and then is making not really able to make choices about their own livelihood based on the defense they're being given. So I think also the goal is not to not have people found incompetent. It's really to make sure they can participate in their own defense. I think sometimes that nuance of like, how do we, what are we trying to build here is make sure we're kind of seeing it through every one of those steps and every one of those decisions. Because usually it's the defense attorney who would file that initial petition to uh, for a doubt or a, a doubt of competency, but then that sets off a whole other set of things. So I think understanding who controls what decisions sometimes can be really helpful in that as well. 
And then also knowing like on the front end, like I think you're, I just think of the visual though, like here's the threshold for mental health. Here's the vision, here's the threshold for being picked up on a disorderly conduct. Wow, we're, this is a big gap here, people that are now just gonna be in the ER or the, you know, or the, or the, or the jail system for, you know, relatively low level things. But we're also as a community reaching a breaking point too, and just feeling like we're, you know, we don't have control over these things. So there's kind of a pendulum issue too, a little bit with how people want to deal with, you know, a lot of these challenges. Right. Yeah. And I, I know the, um, the idea of mental health treatment court has been brought up in our county. Um, and I don't know all the different parts and maybe that's where I could use one of these tools to really understand where that is. But I know that there's not a lot of political will to pursue that. Um, so that's maybe where I could uh, kind of look at some of these tools and really figure out where that's where that's coming from. Yeah, on the next call, we'll kind of dig into like in the company part, maybe that's where we can kind of say like, well, how do you build the continuum for the right level of, you know, there's a public safety risk to all these options, and even restoration doesn't end the story. Now the person just continues their case. So in some ways, it's also thinking about where this incompetency piece fits among and the, how the person got there in the pub, in the community to then where they go after they're they're restored, you know, to competency that may not last very long without really, you know, robust, you know, mental health services in the community. So there's still like the same issues still come out of where do you what do you do with people after they come out of jail, given that they're not maybe still not on medication or still not really engaging in services. But thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see. I'm really that one of the other um, chats here. Um, uh, who has jurisdiction of both the state and are looking at how we can work collectively to utilize our office to address some of these complex issues where adults or juveniles are languishing. Um, and I'll kind of, um, maybe Margaret, if you could say a little more about from what you wrote there, but I, I think also having people that are, their job is to be an expediter, to find people that are you know languishing or staying longer. Um, on the data side, that's where kind of using time standards can be helpful. If you see somebody whose case is now at day X or day Y, how can we start to kind of activate the team a little bit? Because in my experience with both on the, the attorney side, is like once they're, once somebody who, you know, was basically a doubt of their competency and now they're kind of off the docket a little bit, you stop thinking about their case until they come back versus having somebody in the community is really kind of focused on this person to say, when they come back, we need to start this process again. And I think a little bit happens is that if they're not, how do you, who's really keeping track of who's languishing would be maybe a way to think about that in some of these systems. And that could be like an, an ombudsman, which actually has that that role as well. Um, so Margaret, I think that's a good a good collaboration effort. How do we look at who's not fitting into these boxes, that gap between mental health care and then the jail system thresholds or a justice system threshold? And, it, and I think one of the things that happens so often is that when those when there's multiple jurisdictional pieces overlapping, um, it ends up being kind of this not us, not us. And so I, I think it's so we see that a lot of people are doing everything they possibly can. Uh, and there's a lot of people that are looking at the issue, but there's um, these significant gaps because people don't have that jurisdictional overlap. And so we're trying to figure out how do we convene these um, collaborative groups to really address those system gap pieces. And so this is an incredibly, I wasn't sure if this would be um, a conversation that would uh, be a good fit or not. And I, I'm just really appreciative. I think this has been so helpful. Looking forward to the next one. Uh, this has been fantastic. Great. Um, and I think that's kind of why the, the competency issue kind of struck is like a, a way to get more specific. So, you know, as you're kind of thinking where this is going to go next, it's like, okay, we've, gosh, people in, are with mental health needs and are unhoused and they're coming in contact, but then how do we then see they're now becoming incompetent to stand trial? Now, what do we do in a more robust way? So that's kind of where I was trying to take the, the train here a little bit is not keep it so general, but get a little more specific. Um, but yeah, hopefully, and that'll maybe bring out some more conversation too. So I'm glad this feels like a useful, useful track to use to your time. One more chat, one more comment here. Uh, Brent, you want to come off mute just for a uh, last comment here? I was trying to read through it, but I feel like you might be able to do it more justice if you're still there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, it just it seems like uh, we are getting a lot of people in our facility that have mental health issues on legitimate crimes when they're out on the street they they commit crimes that they need to be placed in the jail 
But when we get here, you know, they've got a first appearance, which can take X number of days. And then uh, for their next hearing, uh, the attorney brings up that they think they have mental health issues. So they need a competency hearing. And to get them to that hearing is going to be maybe a couple months later on down the road. Um, they go for a competency hearing and decide, well, we need to send them to a mental health facility so they can get back on their medications and they can comprehend what's going on. That can last uh, anywhere from a week to, to a month to two months. They bring them back to our facility, book them back in. And then the court hearing is four months down the road. And in between that time, they uh, commit another crime in the facility and say like another inmate uh, where we, you know, that person wants to press charges. So we have to press charges. And then they stop taking their medication. They go for that hearing and we get sent back for another competency hearing. And it's just a vicious cycle that's going back and forth, back and forth. And it just seems like our facility is, is getting more and more of those people that we don't think they need to be here per se, but because of what they're doing out on the street, yeah, they do need to be here, but we don't want them in here because they take up so much time with our staff, you know, um, two deputy rules or, or whatever, it just takes up a lot of time when we're dealing with them. And I just wondered, does anybody else have that problem? I can say yes. <laughs> we have um, we we looked at our um, folks that are being committed uh, to our state hospital, and twenty percent of them have been committed within the past year or two. Like so, it's a it's kind of a revolving door. Um, so we worked with the our the people doing our competency evaluations, um, and did just a bunch of research and. Um, we're getting ready to launch a mobile competency restoration team, which is based on like an ACT model, but they'll be able to go into the jail or serve people in the community so we can hopefully get them to the least restrictive setting possible. So if the judge won't allow them to be released to the community for services, they could still serve them in the jail. And we're really hoping one of the components of that is that they're going to have to connect. They, they stay with the person until their case is resolved and they're connected to community resources. So it's not like here's a referral, good luck. It's gonna be that definite warm handoff and maybe some overlap there um, because we're really trying to stop that cycle of um, they're, 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 they're restored and then like within two weeks, they're not competent again. You know, we just constantly see that. So we're really trying to address that. Um, and I'm crossing my fingers. We we should be launching by the end of the year. Um, our provider is hiring right now. So I'm really hoping next year I have good things to report to you. Great. Well, I know we're a little past time and it looks like Kevin's frozen. So I don't know if his, he looks thoughtful though. So uh, I don't know if his computer's stuck or if it might be on my end, um, but definitely wanted to thank everyone for the conversation today. Um, I know that uh, competency came up several times. And so we're actually having our second session focused on competency restoration. So applying these tools and framework and walking you through the steps for problem solving when it comes to competency to, to stand trial. So we'll put a link to the chat or a link in the chat to the next session on October 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then we'll send out by email this link as well and the tools that Kevin shared during the session today. Um, but yeah, I feel like we're just getting started and warmed up, um, but looking forward to the next session and feel free to reach out by email if you have any additional follow-up questions as well. Thanks so much, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. All right, take care. Bye.